On February 6, at about 4 a.m. local time, the ground in southern Turkey and northern Syria shook for more than a minute while most people slept. In the dark, millions of people had to flee, trying to stay alive and find their family members. As the tremor stopped, the rumbles of buildings collapsing began. And as the sun rose across the devastated region, it unveiled the scale of the disaster. A magnitude 7.8 earthquake, with its epicenter 32 kilometers west of the Turkish city of Gaziantep, had struck the region, cracking the ground open and causing extensive damage. And nearly 10 hours later, another seismic event of magnitude 7.5 shook the region again. Since then, other tremors and aftershocks have followed. The area is at the crossroads of a complex tectonic structure bordered by the north and east Anatolian faults. But as many other fault systems remain active around the world, what spots could see tremors like these? Can earthquakes ever be predicted? And what can we learn from what happened in Turkey and Syria? Lucy Jones is one of the world's leading seismologists. She spent decades studying earthquakes and advocating for risk reduction policies. She's written more than 100 research papers on the subject, and one month since the disaster in Turkey and Syria, we'll ask her what lessons can be drawn. Seismologist Lucy Jones talks to Al Jazeera. Dr. Lucy Jones, thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera. I know that uh, over the last few weeks we've, we've seen and watched a lot of the images and, and pictures come through of the, the human toll, uh, the death and destruction um, coming out of Turkey and Syria. But from your point of view, from a science point of view, what's been your initial reaction? Well, uh, as a seismologist, what's happening in this earthquake is, of course, interesting to us scientifically. It's also not particularly surprising. It is what happens when you have a, a major strike-slip earthquake. They you know, only happen once every few years somewhere in the world. When you put it near people, it becomes, of course, a whole different situation. Is there anything that surprised you? Uh, scientifically, not particularly. I mean, the, the large aftershock was very interesting. I spent much of my career studying the earthquake statistics, how foreshocks and main shocks, aftershocks, how the whole thing fit together. And so this is, uh, I, it's not average, but it's, it's not unusual either. It's about maybe 10 or 15% of the sequences will have an aftershock this large, usually on a separate fault. So that's uh, scientifically really interesting just how that goes on, but it's also not unexpected. We've, we've seen it before. So if the earthquake itself wasn't unexpected, is some of the damage that we've seen, these buildings that have pancaked, the, you know, the, the thousands and thousands of people that have been displaced? Yes, I mean, absolutely. The extent of the damage is much greater than was, you know, than was predicted. Uh, there's a U.S. Geological Survey has a program that automatically looks at what the shaking distribution is and what the people distribution is. And they estimated that the death toll was likely to be close to a thousand people. And of course, it's much larger than that. So the damage is more than the standard models predict. There's a lot of um, assumptions being made that this must be because of corruption. And I think I'm sure that's playing a role in every country that plays a role. Building codes are, you know, are uh, government regulations and a lot of people don't want to follow government regulations. Um, but I think that we're going to need more extensive studies to really understand what's going on completely. I mean, there's sort of three ways that you <laughs> that keep us from having good buildings when we have a good building code. And mm. Turkey has a great building code. Well, Turkey has the the same international building code that everybody else uses, right? Now, one problem can be older buildings that are built to a previous code or with no, you know, as long as they're old and haven't been retrofitted, they're, they're at risk. The second thing is enforcement of the code. How did that happen? How much corruption went on? Again, a problem in every country. But the third thing is that our code actually works pretty hard to minimize the cost the extra cost of construction, and therefore asks only that the building not kill people, that they shouldn't collapse. And of course, way more buildings in Turkey collapse than would be expected. 
well, and we, we also saw that the ground motions, how much the earth shook was more than the code said would happen from this size earthquake. So to what degree was the code inadequate? Did it not properly model how big the earthquake can be? And it didn't actually, it doesn't give us a margin of error. The, the code says, if your building's a total financial loss, that was your choice to make. Mm. The only role of government and the code is to keep it from killing people. Now, clearly it didn't succeed in not killing people, but the level, you know, the fact that maybe a half of the buildings are going to be, are badly damaged, the code goes, okay, that's fine. That was your choice to make. And many people don't recognize that's the way the building code is structured. Before this big quake, how would you have rated Turkey's preparedness for a big earthquake like this? Obviously, it's on a major fault line. Everyone knew that it was going to be prone to, to having a large earthquake. We've seen many earthquakes over the, the last couple of decades um, you know, in Turkey. So how would you rate their preparedness for something like this? And then how is it stacked up with what you've seen play out? There are more people dead than I expected beforehand because because of the um, the code is very good. The engineers are very good. We've I worked with a lot of Turkish engineers. They're very much part of the international community, and that's why I want to see have we missed something in creating the code or not. Turkey, in terms of scientific understanding and engineering expertise, it's up there with with the rest of the world because they know they have a problem. They've had a lot of really dedicated scientists working to it. And this is where I feel like I don't know how much it's the lack of enforcement of the code and how much the international code really has failed and really hasn't understood what these type of earthquakes could be because we haven't had a major strike slip earthquake with modern construction and the modern code uh, since the code was really adopted in the last 20 years. Um, so the studies are gonna be important. Preparedness is a complicated thing. Preparedness is, is a combination of how much you try to prevent the losses in the first place. And that requires a strong community that's willing to spend a little more up front to get the better result in the long run. And um, that's a very cultural sort of thing. It's something the United States struggles with a lot. Mm. We don't do community really well. It's also the degree of enforcement. How much do you really, what the, what laws do you really put behind it and how do you make sure that they, they get enforced? Um, and then there's also, you know, I think one of the big things is what's going to be happening in the next few months. How much are people going to come in and help each other? And I think that that's one thing where Turkey may be a bit stronger, that there's a, um, a, a, a network of strong connections between people to help each other and that sounds rather, you know, wishy-washy in some ways, but it's an incredibly important part of being able to come back from an earthquake. Just sticking uh, to the building code, are there, you know, obviously tens and tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people live uh, on fault lines, you know, especially around the, the Pacific Rim. They'll be watching this program and wondering if what happened in Turkey, can that happen to where I live? What would you say to them, especially when questions are now being raised about the building code, you know, if Turkey was using the code that is of international standard. So what would you say to those people that are watching, potentially worried that the same thing could happen in their town? Yes, it could. And you need to, um, we can't just dismiss what's happening here. We need to use this as an opportunity to really examine what we were getting from the code, to what degree it worked, how can we improve it? how much is enforcement versus the code itself. And we're only going to figure that out with some more research. But I think all of us who live in seismically active areas, and I live very close to the San Andreas Fault, which is going to get an earthquake very similar to this, um, we need to understand what we're getting and make a decision how much we want. Um, you know, earthquakes become particularly scary and we, we're willing usually to do a bit more, but we also have a window of opportunity right now while everybody's seeing the suffering in Turkey and, and uh, Syria to say, if I don't want that, I need to be doing something in my community to change that outcome. Just one last question on, on the buildings, especially the ones that we saw collapse uh, in this earthquake. Can you explain what type of buildings those typically were and how common they are in other parts of the world? Older buildings built out of concrete have some major issues. They've been damaged and or collapsed in previous earthquakes, and the current code 
tries to prevent that from happening with what puts in here. So if you've got concrete buildings, especially multi-story ones, and you have them very near the fault, therefore they're getting strong shaking, uh, those are the probably the worst type of buildings that we're talking about. I didn't see many pictures of older masonry construction, you know, bricks or or stones or adobe. Um, and maybe that's just not the pictures that showed up. Those always do badly in earthquakes. But uh, Turkey, I know, has been part of trying to, to get rid of that type of construction. And I, I haven't seen pictures of it. I can just I can't judge it from personal knowledge, though. Now that um, Turkey and Syria have had you know, a very large earthquake, does that reset the clock for them and give them a, a grace period at all? Is there now a window where they can sit back and go, we're not going to have another big quake because we've had ours? Or is that not the case at all? Not the case. Only, I mean, for the section that actually moved in this earthquake and that's having aftershocks right now, most of the stress is being relieved from that section. Um, but we often see like the next section of the fault then going soon. And especially in Turkey, historically, the North Anatolian fault had a sequence of earthquakes over a couple of decades, where every few years there was another seven on each on a different part of the fault. So no, you cannot use this as a window to say, okay, now we've got a break. If anything, there's a slight increase in risk over the next decade or so, at least relatively nearby. I mean, Istanbul also, of course, has a, a huge risk from the North Anatolian fault. It's far enough away from this. I don't think it's increased the risk particularly, but it definitely hasn't decreased the risk. Will we ever be able to predict earthquakes yeah, my personal belief is that we will never predict earthquakes because to predict the big earthquake, you need to not just predict the time of an event, you need to predict the magnitude of the future event. And as far as we can tell at this point, big and small earthquakes begin the same way. What determines the magnitude is, is uh, how far down the fault the rupture happens. So it starts at a point and there's a basically like a rip going down the fault. And if it goes for 100 meters, you've got a magnitude four. If you if it goes for 100 kilometers, you have a magnitude seven. The mm -hmm. 7.8 was about 400 kilometers long. But what de so that what determines the magnitude is how far it moves down the fault. And that may be independent of how it starts. And if that's the case, prediction of a big earthquake is completely impossible. And I think that's the most likely interpretation of, of the data as, as I see it right now. One thing about that, though, is really, do you want two hours to get out of a bad building or a building that doesn't fall down in the first place? And in fact, the, the real solution to earthquakes is not predicting them. It's making the commitment up front that just barely strong enough to not kill you is not an acceptable standard in the building code. And we need to be trying to create buildings that we can come home to after the earthquake. And I guess that is what your career has been all about, hasn't it? Is trying to convince people and governments to to actually focus on this. I mean, how difficult has that been um, over over your career to to, to do? Well, I, it's a pretty long career at this point. I began trying to predict earthquakes. I mean, I started graduate school in 1976, and we thought that prediction was just around the corner. So I developed all these probabilities and try to look at the statistics and come to the conclusion that. This part probably really is random. And therefore, I ended up switching what I worked on about 20 years ago towards focusing on helping people understand what the impacts would be of the earthquake. I mean, when we talk about predicting, we're focusing on the part we don't understand, the time. And that means we're not talking part, about the part we do understand, which is what the shaking will be, what the damage will be, how we're going to be able to cope with it. And clearly people don't understand it or we wouldn't be building things the yeah. way we are right now. It's a long process. Um, we've been able in California in these last 20 years to see some changes. We've started having some major retrofit programs and we're still trying to change the building code to say we should be able to use the building after the earthquake, not just not be crushed. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, early warning systems. If we can't predict earthquakes, then oh. uh, hopefully <laughs> we'll be able to warn as many people as possible. Can you explain some of the warning right. systems that, that are already in place and what you would like to see more of? Okay, yeah. The war early warning is, is what we turn to when we realize that we weren't going to actually predict the earthquakes. So early warning is 
having enough seismic instruments out that when an earthquake begins, you can recognize it very, very quickly because you have lots of seismic stations near where it's beginning. And now you have the information that the earthquake's begun and you can send that information electronically, which is the speed of light. And then that information gets to you before the waves do, which are traveling at the speed of sound. And these actually earthquakes like the one that just happened in Turkey are uh, the type that can be very um, effectively warned about because the rupture starts at one place. Not just the waves have to travel out, but the rupture actually has to travel down the fault. And that gives you a bit more time to, to, to get the warnings out. Um, and we've Japan was the first country to go live with an earthquake early warning system uh, here in California. We've now been doing it for the last few years. Uh, what you need to do it effectively is a lot of seismic stations, really good communication and computers connecting those stations and then good communication and to get the signal out to people who can use it. The advent and widespread distribution of smartphones has made that last part a lot easier but you have to um, have to work with the phone companies to uh, get that signal turned around very, very quickly. Mm. Most other messages, it doesn't matter if it takes a few seconds or tens of seconds to get to you, whereas you've lost the value of early warning if that's yeah. the case. Just on the Turkey earthquake, how long would they have had if there was an early warning system in place there from the beginning of that fault to the end of that fault? Are we talking a matter of seconds or a minute? It's still a, a matter of seconds. The earthquake itself probably took about two minutes to happen. So if you were at the northern end of the fault, where away from where it began, but still close to the fault and therefore a lot of damage, you might have had a minute's warning. That would have been the maximum. Uh, if you were back where the earthquake began, you got almost no warning at all. So it isn't one number for the whole yeah. fault. It's, you know, it's depending on where, where you are where the to luck the of so what can you do yeah, in such yeah. a short amount of time, in literally seconds? What, what would your advice be if someone gets an alert on their phone? What can you do in, in 5 or 10, 15 seconds? One thing you can do is get yourself into a safer place just right away. I mean, we talk about drop cover, hold on. When you have full building collapses, that's harder. But there's no way you're getting out of the building in this time. Getting under a sturdy table gives you the possibility that you're going to have uh, you're not going to have your muscles crushed and that you will have an airspace to stay alive in and people be able to come in and get you. And it's interesting. We've actually did some testing and basically it takes like 10 seconds for most people to get under a table, even if they're nearby to it. Mm. And so that extra few seconds can really make a difference. The other things that can be done um, that can be very important is you know move an elevator to the nearest floor and open the door. So a lot of if you connected your you know your building's electrical systems and automatically to this warning, um, not being trapped in an elevator until somebody can get in and get you out. Uh, having ringing an alarm in a doctor's office, so you know the, or the surgery room, so they pull the knife out of your chest, or the dentist gets the drill out of your mouth before the shaking comes through. Um, those are all things that would be helpful. And then in Japan, they've been able to do a lot of automatic systems with factories and such things that greatly reduce the losses that happen in the event. I was just about to ask you about Japan. Is there, is there, are they the gold standard of, of um, I guess, using technology to, to warn people? Um, I think that what they have uh, gives you warning, allows you to get into a safer place. But the other thing they do that's probably more important to replicate and probably costs more than putting out sensors is they build buildings with, you know, the intent that they stay up and stay working. Mm. The other country that's done a very good job with this is actually Chile. So Chile has had historically the largest earthquakes in the world. They had a magnitude 9.5 back in 1960. And they're built, they use the same international building code that we all do, but they implement it in a different way. If you're an owner, a building owner, and you build a building in Chile, and it is damaged in an earthquake in the next decade, you are liable, even if you've already sold the building. Whereas most other places, like both Turkey and, and, and us, um, in California, once you're past the building official, you're home free. You no longer have a responsibility. Mm. And so the Chilean owners know and builders know that they're going to be held liable for this. 
and uh, they just don't take the risks. We're looking at the earthquake here, and it's it's terrifying. There's no way around it. We also know that climate change will not change the rate of earthquakes, but it is going to be changing the rate of wildfires. It already is, and cyclones and hurricanes and a lot of floods, a lot of other disasters. So big disasters are going to become more a part of our lives over the coming decades. And we need ways to work with each other to stay resilient and not get paralyzed by the fear of them. Do you feel like anyone is listening to that message, especially in government? Government is probably the hardest group to talk to about this sort of message because it's um, the problem may not be within the term of the elected mm. official. And so if they put energy into trying to be more resilient to earthquakes or other disasters, and it doesn't happen before they're out of office, well, they look ineffective. And if it does happen before they're out of office, the, their changes probably haven't had time to take effect, so it looked like what they did did no good. Uh, it's really a catch-22 for elected officials, and we need to find ones with vision. It does happen. You know, we've gotten some big changes when you get the right advocate in place, but you have to look for a person who's willing to fight for it. Can a culture that has never experienced a huge earthquake, a city or a town or a country, can they change in anticipation of a large earthquake rather than afterwards when it clearly is too late, do you think? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you decide to do it, it's not cheap. You have to work at it. But you could you do th one thing is figure out which buildings you're going to have problems with. Um, you know, actually, I, I, I'll take one example. It's a, a utility here in Southern California with the, our elect, big electrical utility. Um, they decided they had to grapple with this and they spent the time and the money to survey all of their buildings, which is a lot of them. It's a really big area that's covered and figure out which ones were problems and prioritize how they were going to go about fixing them. And gradually, and it takes time, but they're getting there. And so you can do it. Um, it's hard emotionally, and you need to have some extra resources. If you're already struggling for other reasons, it's almost impossible to get the extra bandwidth you need to cope with that future disaster. Mm. So I guess relaying it back to what we're seeing in Syria in particular, a country that has been you know, obviously ravaged by an awful uh, civil war for over a decade. I mean, is that indicative of poorer countries, poorer regions, just not being able to have the resources or the funds to even think about um, potentially, you know, looking after themselves, preparing themselves um, for when a big earthquake strikes? Well, right. And it, but it's, it's true of every disaster, which you're already suffering or if it's, you know, having an earthquake on top of a civil war, there's no resources left. And, and I think in many ways, even though the Syrian people are a little bit farther away from the fault itself and therefore not getting quite a strong shaking, in many ways they could be suffering worse because they, they're starting from such a uh, difficult place. What do you hope to learn from this earthquake, both uh, scientifically, but also from the, the, the impact it, is, it has had on, uh, on the people, you know, socially? Well, I think the most important thing we can learn is uh, how did the building code really perform? Uh, we've got to do detailed research and separate out what might have happened because it wasn't properly in place and how much it was really a deficiency of the code. And remember that it's going to be, we have a strong psychological drive to blame someone. We would much rather think that it was corruption than a fundamental problem in the code. And so that's going to require really important work. And I think it's uh, it might help all of us move forward because of this. But I think also the socially um, disasters are very difficult. There are many governments in the history of humankind that have fallen because of not handling a disaster well. And a few that have been definitely strengthened by handling the aftermath of, of a disaster very well, especially with the two different countries and the two different situations. I think we're going to the, the people who study the social impact of disasters are going to have a lot, lot to learn about how people can come back from this. It's a 
the next six months maybe is the really critical time for the governments to show whether or not they could be trusted to handle the aftermath. Yeah, I know we uh, and everyone around the world be keeping a very, very close eye on uh, what's going to happen in Turkey and Syria uh, over the next uh, six months or so. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lucy Jones, for talking to Al Jazeera. We really, really do appreciate your time and, uh, and your expertise and insight. Thank you. I do appreciate you having me. Thanks.